in Romans again next week, Lord willing. Good Lord willing and the creek don't rise. I've got a buddy who gets mad at that. He said, it's not about water, it's about the creek Indians. And you're saying, I said, calm down, man. Calm down. How about a little grace? This week I want to share a few things with you that, that I got from this conference this week. And then I've got something really special that, that I want to show you. Uh, a video after that that I, that I got from out there. Um, our, our week was spent out there, um, teacher after teacher after teacher after teacher, just going through in amazing detail and power over, over just a few verses. We spent the whole week in Revelation, uh, which is where we're going to be this morning. If you want to be heading over there, we're going to be in Revelation 3. Here's what I got from the pastor's conference this week. It, it's great just to get away from home and get somewhere else, and it kind of helps you get perspective. So I'm out there this week, and, and I'm sitting in this, uh, if any of you saw the picture that I put up on Facebook, there were 1,300 of us in this room, and these are senior pastors and, and assistant pastors and some worship leaders and, and that uh, powerful worship, man, when you get that many, that many men singing, at the top, singing that song at the top of their lungs in that room, and the place was shaking. It was just beautiful. But I was sitting there one day just watching everybody file in, and I was thinking, this, this conference is like, I bet, no other religious conference in the world. Man, there were people like you wouldn't believe coming there. All different kinds of people, all different races, people from all over the world. You got guys with tattoos on their head and chain wallets, and you got guys like me, and you got guys that are in shape, and you got um, <laughs> just all, every kind of people out there. And the, that just struck me as beautiful. I'm sitting there looking at all of these different people, and I'm thinking, man, there's not a one of these people that has the exact same story as somebody else, except, except every single one of us came to this realization that we were lost in our sin and dying and on our way to hell, and Jesus saved us. And all gathered together for that one purpose, all these different guys sitting there just taking in the teaching. It's like, yeah, give me more, give me more, give me more. And it's just beautiful. And Paul, I ran into some BFC guys up there and hung out with them for a little bit. I met Paul's pastor from when he goes to Minnesota, the church that he goes to when he's up there. I met him and talked to him for a while. I, uh, I met the, uh, the pastor that the Swikards uh, knew down in Georgia before they came up here. I talked to him for a while. He's a doctor, a retired doctor. So I talked to him and I talked to drug dealers and, and misfits of all. Not anymore. <laughs> Not anymore. He used to be a doctor. They used to be drug dealers. See, it's, they, they, he retired. They retired. <laughs> but my point was, man, the gospel is for everybody. And why in the world would you want your church to look like one person? Why would everybody want to dress alike and look alike? Man, as, as small as this church is, I love the diversity here, man. We got people from all around the world right here in this room right now. And, and we're all totally different except... Man, we all got Jesus. And that's beautiful. The gospel is for everybody. God's calling and the gifts that He gives you to carry out His calling on your life, that's for everybody. The Holy Spirit, the, the movement, the power, the strength, the leadership, the conviction, that's for everybody. God can use anybody who wants to be used. Here's some of the diversity that I saw out there. I met one of the guys that roomed with us. And just, I mean, if you saw pictures of the place, the place is gorgeous. Okay, there's no denying. The place is gorgeous, and there's these beautiful natural hot springs that you get in and sit. So there was some vacation involved. But the living quarters, if you stay on campus, okay, it's, it's like a six-bed college dorm. Okay, there's six, six guys in this room. Um, yeah, by Wednesday, it was, it was about time to go, to be honest with you. You know, at first, everybody's being careful not to offend anybody, and, you know, you know they're waking themselves up if they're snoring, and they're cleaning up all their stuff in the bathroom. By Wednesday, it's like, man, you're going there, you're stepping over towels and rags. Just human nature. But the, the guy that was in the bed right next to me, I thought he was like 20 years old. Man, dude, just seems young. Turns out he's 33, which is still a kid to me, I guess. But... but um, I would have thought 23 at the most. But his name is Everton. He's from Brazil. Grew up, uh, family was very religious, Assemblies of God. Um, his, his father and, and grandfather before him were, were heavy-duty guys in that church, and his mom was very religious. He grew up with that. And by the time he was a teenager, in that specific church, and I'm not knocking the movement, but in that church where he was, he saw some fakeness about it. He saw, you know, the... Because they're really big in the manifestations of the Spirit, speaking in tongues and prophecy and all of that. And, man, I love that stuff. I'm all for it if it's real. 
But by the time he was a teenager, he was starting to see, I don't know, man, it's the same people all the time, and they seem to really kind of revel in the attention that they're getting. I don't know about all of this. So he was getting a little hinky about it, right? Just about that time, some Calvary Chapel guy from California comes down there and starts a Bible study. He goes over there. It's the first time he's ever just heard a, a real hardcore Bible study in his life. And man, it just lit him up. And now he's in mentorship out in Santa Barbara under a, a great teacher, David Guzik, and he's going to spend the rest of the year, Lord willing, in the country and, and boning up, and then he's going He's going to be a pastor somewhere in Brazil. And I said, where are you going, Everett? And he said, I don't know. I don't know, man. I'm just going. He said, there's a guy over here that just started a church. I may go over there and try to help him for a little while. He's just getting started, but I don't know. I may go back to my hometown. I don't know. And he was excited. I don't know. <laughs> That's what made me think he was younger. By the time I was 30, I was like, I better know exactly what's going on tomorrow you know, or I'm going to get really uncomfortable. He was fine with it, man. He was like, I don't know. He was great with that. So Everton was fantastic. I did meet this Hispanic drug dealer, and we sat and talked for a while. And uh, great story. He, uh, he said that uh, he dealt drugs all his life, uh, Vegas and L.A. and anywhere he could find people that, that wanted drugs. He was Johnny on the spot to provide them, right? He said, that's all he ever did. It's the only job he ever had. So he finally gets caught. He gets sent to federal prison in Alabama. And he said, I learned two things in prison in Alabama. I said, what was that? He said, well, the first thing was black people can cook. <laughs> that's exactly what he said. He said, he said, all of the cooks on the staff at the prison were black. He said, man, that's the best food I've ever had in my life. <laughs> I said, what was the other thing you learned? He said, I learned that Jesus saves. And I got saved in that prison. He said, when I came out, I came back out here. And he said, I didn't know what to do. He said, I went to the Bible college, and I took some classes, and after that, when I graduated, he said, I didn't know what to do next. He said, I didn't know how to do anything else but sell drugs. He said, I didn't know how to work with my hands. I didn't know how to build stuff. He said, so I just started doing what I knew how to do. He said, I went back to the streets of Vegas in L.A., and now I'm pushing the gospel. He said, I'm the dealer, man. If you need it, I got it. <laughs> And he was so excited. He, he started, to, he was under somebody's mentorship and they started a Bible study and he kind of took it over and it grew a little bit and grew a little bit and grew a little bit. And he said, last Sunday was our first actual Sunday calling ourselves a church. I said, man, that's exciting. What, what have you seen happen in there? He said, well, you know, in my community, he said, you know, we're, we're very, very Roman Catholic. You know, that's what I'm running into for the most part. And they don't really get what we're doing. He said, but I had this kid that was coming. He was coming, and he was in, man. The, the gospel got a hold of him, and he was on fire for God, and he, he finally gets his parents in there. And he said, you know, at first, they're very gruff and kind of grim, and, man, they're not happy to be there. They're just trying to be nice to him, but they don't, they don't care anything about what I'm doing. He said, but you know what? They kept coming. He said, man, over time, man, the walls start breaking down, and they get a little softer and a little softer. And he said, the kid came running up to me the other day. He said, he said, Pastor, you know what happened? He said, what happened? He said, he said my dad just got rid of all of our Mary statues that were in the house. He said, they used to be all over the place. He said, we weren't allowed to touch them. You know, we couldn't breathe on them, man. You had to be real careful with those things. He said, he just trashed them, man. Just threw them out. That's because the gospel got a hold of them. Beautiful stuff going on. I met this guy named Pancho Juarez, and you need to look up this guy's teaching on the internet. Big church out in L.A. He is unbelievable. Man, just on fire. He's got so much personality. You just want to be close to this guy, right? But he's up there, and it's kind of the same story. He came from a background in drugs and alcohol and womanizing and all of that and, and dealing and this, that, and the other. So he was nothing but trouble to his mom, and she was so faithful, Catholic again. Uh, she was so faithful, just praying for him all the time and, and, and wishing he would get saved. And, and he finally gets it. He's at a rock concert at a Calvary Chapel out there. That's what they were known for. This is back in the 70s, mid-70s. So that's how Calvary Chapel really got well-known out there. They had these concerts, and guys would come, and all the beach bums would come in there, and they'd get saved, right? Part of the Jesus movement. You ever heard anything about that? So he's at a, at a, a rock concert at, at, at Costa Mesa one night. He gets saved. And just totally changed, right? So he gets married, and he gets plugged in at a church, and, and before he, he had been going to this denominational church, and he was there for a little while, and he's like, man, I'm on fire, and I'm ready to serve. I'm ready to do something. I go to the leadership. I'm like, hey, I'm ready to serve. I'm ready to do something. They were like, well, you need to go to Bible college, and you need to go to seminary. And as soon as you've learned some things, we will be glad to test you out here and see if, Lord willing, he would allow you to lead a Bible study or something. I was like, oh, I can't do that. He said, I couldn't read. He said, that's going to be a problem. I can't read. He said, I love God, and I'm taking in all these Bible studies, and I'm learning to read, but I'm not really good. I can't go to college. So he said, that kind of bummed me out. I spent a couple years there sitting there thinking, just wishing I could serve, wishing I could do something. 
He said, finally, I just couldn't take it anymore. I, just, I told my wife I just had to get away. He said, I've gotten saved at Discovery Chapel, and I found one. It was a drive to get there, he said, but I started going. And they were meeting in a, what used to be an old grocery store or something, that, you know, in a, in a strip mall, big, huge parking lot. He said, but there was a lot of other businesses there, and this church was huge, and, and they had like three services on Sunday. And he said, there were so many people coming in there, and all the other businesses were open. He said, traffic was a nightmare. He said, it was chaos. He said, and as an ex-Marine, I don't like chaos. I like things to be in order. He said, so I went up to, to some of the leadership one day. I was like, I was like, man, somebody ought to do something about the parking out here. And they said, is that on your heart? And I said, yeah. And they said, won't you do something about it? <laughs> he said, do I have to go to college first? They said, no. <laughs> so for 13 years, he parked cars in the parking lot at this Calvary Chapel. He made order. He bought cones. And he trained people. And he, he moved. He said, I just parked cars for 12 years, waiting on whatever God had next. Now he's a pastor of a humongous church. God blessed his, his obedience and his willingness and his desire to take what God had done for him and share it with somebody else. He, he said he finally got his mom to come to one of his services. His church was up to about 600. They were meeting in a warehouse. He said to finally get her to come, and she didn't want to come because she's still a hardcore Roman Catholic, right? It's got came just to appease me one time. He said she walked in, she saw all those people, and she said, she said, she said, Ancho, all these people here to hear you talk? I said, yeah, Mom. She said, did they know about you? <laughs> That's the power of God, right? He's a different God than he used to be. This guy that she used to pray for, and he was breaking her heart. Now he's leading people to Christ all the time. Beautiful story. Met this guy named Bob Davis. Spent almost the whole week with this guy. And he's just the nicest, most unassuming guy. You, would, you wouldn't think he was anybody, right? Everybody loves him. He's always he's the king of the one-liners, man. He's got a one-liner for everything that you say. And it's just, it's just funny. Great guy to be around. Obviously doesn't take himself very seriously. But you wouldn't really think he's all that deep a guy, to be honest with you. Because he's just zing, 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 right, with the one-liners. So we go one night to this, to this thing. This ministry has a presentation. I'd never heard of them, but it's called Far-Reaching Ministries. And they go to Sudan and train Christians in the Sudanese army to be... Um, chaplains and the army allows them to do that they, they started with about 20 guys a few years ago now they have between three and four hundred and these are guys in war on the front lines going out there and being chaplains for their brothers they pray with them when they're hurt and when they're dying and they bring a little bit of, a little bit of peace in the middle of that chaos that's what this ministry does and how they do it is they take Calvary Chapel pastors and you go over there and teach for two weeks so these guys spend a year under hardcore seminary-like teaching for a year. And they, they, teach, they teach the whole Bible in a year over there. And I heard somebody say the word Sudan in talking to this guy, Bob Davis, that you wouldn't take seriously at all. And after I saw that presentation, I said, I said, Bob, I heard somebody say something about Sudan to you. Have you been over there? He said, I go almost every year. I said, I wasn't able to go this year, but I went last year. He's talking about being over there and shells coming in. They're having to jump in foxholes. And, and this guy has got it. it. His life has radically changed. He used to be a Las Vegas cop. Got saved. Now he's a pastor of a big church out in Iowa somewhere. And God has changed him to the point that, man, he ain't afraid of nothing. But he's so unassuming. He doesn't bring any attention to himself. But you walk in that room where he is, and there's person after person coming up to him, shaking his hand, giving him a hug, telling him they're glad to see him. That's, that's God shining light through somebody. And, and he's not taking any of the credit. If you're familiar with the Blue Letter Bible, uh, and if not, you should be, go to the Internet and just search Blue Letter Bible. It's a, a great uh, free website that you can go to. They have apps uh, for phones and stuff too. Uh, a lot of commentaries, a lot of teaching on there. You can... Go find a specific place in the Bible and you want to know something about that, there's a little box next to it. You click on it, it'll pull up a list of guys teaching about that verse. That kind of thing. Um, almost all of his teaching is on really people around the world that love this guy. And it's just, for me, it was the, the perfect picture of what we all ought to be. I fell in love with this guy, just hanging out with him, because he's just a joy to be around. It's just a joy to be around. And then I found out, man, he's really ministering for God and changing people's lives. And I hope that's who we all are.
There was nothing about him that said, hey, look at me. Or, hey, I'm a big deal. Or He, he, never, he never said anything about anything that, that God had accomplished through it. And you had to pull it out of him. And I love that. Those are some of the guys that I met out there. Calvary Chapel really does try to, try to show the love of Jesus to everybody because that's what it's all about. People of all kinds are drawn to real faith in a real God with real power to save. And that's who we have to be. That's what I saw out there. Now, we were in Revelation, like I said, out there. In Revelation, there are all these letters, uh, seven letters to the, from Jesus to the seven churches, right? And in the New King James Version, it, it, it subheads all of the, the sections. So when, when you look at it in the New King James, it, it, these letters are, are kind of titled. It says who they're to. One of them is called the loveless church. One of them is called the compromising church, the corrupt church, the dead church, the lukewarm church. That's five of them. Those guys aren't doing so well. There's a lot of reproof, a lot of conviction that Jesus wants to get to those guys. So hopefully they'll turn around. There are two churches that he doesn't say anything against. One is the persecuted church, the one in Smyrna. Um, and those guys just had it rough. And, and if you ever really dig into Scripture, persecution is always meant as something to refine you, to bring the good to the top. That's how we're supposed to thrive in those situations where other people fall apart. And, and they had done that. And, and he praised them for that. Now, the church that we studied out there this week is the, the one in Philadelphia, which he calls the faithful church. And I just want to read the passage to you. This is Revelation 3, verse 7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts, and shuts and no one opens. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength, have kept my word, and have not denied my name. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one may take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem which comes down out of heaven from my God, and I will write on him my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says. We spent a lot of time this week talking about the description of Jesus in verse 7 there. Who is Jesus? He's the one who is holy, the one who is true, the one who has the key who can open and no one shuts and shut and no one opens. We spend a lot of time praising God, praising our Jesus for what He has done. We love Him so much for what He has done for us. He's given us stories like that drug dealer I met in L.A. And we love Him for that. But don't ever just forget His attributes. Just Sometimes we just need to step back and go, Man, Jesus, I love you for who you are holy and true. A, a shining example we can look to for all the instruction that we will ever need. Somebody we can trust every word that was ever uh, uttered through his lips. And that's a big deal. We have to keep in the forefront of our minds that he is holy and he is true and then we need to act accordingly. We need to pay attention to what he says. We need to think about following him as closely as we can. Let him be our example. Not just a great story to point others to. We should be living this story. Trying to become more like him every day. What about the power that he has to, to open a door nobody can close? To close a door nobody can open? Whatever Jesus asks you to do, whatever leading he gives you through the Holy Spirit, nobody can stop you but you. You feel some some angst in, in your heart now. I think I'm supposed to be doing something. And if the Spirit actually lets you know what that is, see the first step when you get that feeling is you start praying. Well, Lord, show me what it is. Remember when Paul got saved back in Acts that day? What was the what were the first words out of his mouth after he realized Jesus that he had been persecuting was real? Lord, what would you have me do? You first get that feeling that there's something you're supposed to be doing. You just start praying about that. Okay, what is it? What is it? Tell me where to go and I'll go. And when he reveals that to you, you go. You don't let anything stop you. 
Forget the naysayers, the people that are making fun of you, the people that don't believe in you, the people that think you're making something up, that you're acting on your own. If it's real and you know it's real, forget those guys. Synagogue of Satan. It calls those people. They're on of his will. Don't let anything stop you. If he opened the door, he intends you to go through it. He intends to give you the facilities to go through that, the power, the strength, the, the, the opportunity. But if there is something on your heart that you do want to do and you feel like you're bumping up against a closed door and it's not just you know, the hardship of, of following Jesus, if you feel a closed door from Jesus, you just need to stop. And I've been there. And there's stuff I wanted to do. There's stuff I've wanted to do since I took over here. You know, I'm a music guy. I, I really thought, man, I, you put me in charge there. We're going to start having concerts and people are going to start getting saved. And we started doing Saturday night concerts. And they were fantastic. Man, we brought great bands in. And it, was, it was free and we publicized it as much as we could. And we got the word out there. We brought in bands that had local followings, secular bands that had local followings. I thought they'll bring their people with them and then, and then I can share the gospel with them. They'll all get saved. It was a great idea. It wasn't a God idea because it didn't work. There was nobody here but us. And not even many of us, to be honest with you. That was a closed door. So that's what Ventures of Faith in the Calvary Chapel movement is about. Man, you get an idea and God doesn't say, don't do that, go try it. If it's an open door, you're going to see amazing things happen. If it's a closed door, nothing will happen. So then do you sit around mad and... and Challenging yourself, what did I do wrong? No, it's just a closed door. Go look for an open That's what We just stopped doing that. We started doing something else. Maybe we'll get another chance at it sometime. I hope so. I'm still a music guy. I'd still like for that to work. But that wasn't what he wanted. Closed door. Whatever he doesn't want for you, you can't have. We need to get comfortable with that. That's hard. Whatever he doesn't want for you, you can't have. It wouldn't be good for you. It wouldn't make you happy. This is to the church in Philadelphia, this letter. Um, Philadelphia was established as an outpost of Hellenism. It, it was intended to be a place uh, out on the edges of, of barbarism uh, where the people that weren't refined were. It was, it was intended to spread the Greek culture to those people and uh, uh, bring them into a, a ruliness that the Greeks had. Uh, it was called Little Athens because they also had many gods. There's a lot of temples in Philadelphia. The church that was established there was, was small but blessed. We see that. They were small and struggled all the time. They, didn't, they weren't the mega church. They weren't huge. But they were blessed. Jesus has great things to say about them. Blessed for what? He said they had a little strength. That's not a knock. That's not saying you only have a little strength. That was saying, in the middle of the persecution that's around you, all the people that have all these different ideas, and the fact that people aren't getting on board and you aren't growing, you still have strength. You're just saying, that's great. That's awesome. I think that's what he would say to a church like this. And there's strength there. You guys are, you guys are sticking with it. And that's fantastic. He said they kept his word. He always loves that. He preserved this word. You know, when I was out there, if you didn't see the pictures, I got to touch a scroll of the Torah, 72 feet long, somewhere between two and 600 years old, and I got to touch that thing. And the, the, the shape that it was in was amazing. They had traced it back as far as they could. It belonged to some little poor village, and they had spent, I don't know how much money to buy this thing. It would have taken the scribes a year to make that Torah. And it would have been rolled and unrolled and rolled and unrolled and rolled and unrolled who knows how many thousands of times since it was provided to him. And when I looked at it the other day, it looks brand new. And the ink is just as dark black as this lectern. It's just as clear and legible as it can be. They took care of it because it was important. They cared what God had to say. That was the only... Kind. See, they're not like us. They don't all have Bibles laying in the back window of their cars. They don't have Bibles stacked all through their house that they can get to whenever they want. If they happen to take a whim to hear something, no, that was the only copy that village had. And they took care of it, and they read it, and they kept it, they kept his word. They, it says this church at Philadelphia didn't deny his name. We talked yesterday a little bit at the, at the, um, the Father's Day luncheon about being willing to draw a line. 
we have to be willing to draw lines in the sand and go, you know what? I'm a follower of Jesus. I just can't go there to where all of the rest of you are going. I just can't say those words that all the rest of you are saying. I just can't go to that movie that all the rest of you are going to. Because there's something more important going on. I've got to be true to Him. I have to keep His name. I, I, can't, I can't say that I'm a follower of His and do some of this stuff because that's going to make Him look bad. They did not deny His name. They kept His commandment to persevere. There's your description of the kind of discipleship Jesus is looking for. You have the strength that he gives you, you keep his word, you don't deny his name, you keep his commandment to persevere through the problems, and there are going to be problems. No mystery, no complicated formula, certainly no book of rules to memorize. One of the cool things I learned this week on that scroll that I saw, to be a scribe who was allowed to copy the Torah, you had to memorize 4,000 rules concerning the copying of that Torah. So just a little, little apologetics for you real quick. When people challenge you on the fact that, that men have changed Scripture over time, mm -mm. Mm -mm. the rules were so precise in the copying of that Torah, it didn't allow for any changes. They took it very seriously. Those scribes, it, it, when, they, when they were copying the other, the other one to the, to the new, it wasn't like this. It wasn't like, uh, okay, after these things I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven. Uh, da, 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 da. It's not it, not read a sentence, write a sentence. It was read a letter, write a letter. Read a letter, write a letter. Read a letter, write a letter. They weren't allowed to copy whole words at a time. Because there was a chance it might get mixed up in their mind. They might write the wrong word. It wasn't allowed. When the whole thing was finished, and th there, was a, there was a process where if there were some errors in it, they were allowed to fix it. They were allowed to cut out they, they couldn't scribble over, and, you know, like I do. You know, I'm always, if you get a letter from me, there's going to be stuff just marked through, and I'll write another word next to it. They weren't allowed to do that. They weren't allowed to take a letter that was a little bit wrong and try to fix it. If there was a mistake, they had to call people's attention to it. They cut that part out of the scroll and burned it and glued a new clean piece in and then rewrote the word or the letter or whatever. That's how serious they were about mistakes. They did there was no provision for a mistake getting out of the print shop. Okay, When they were finished with the whole thing, they knew, they had done the research and knew where the middle letter in the document was. The single letter that when you go to it, there's so many thousand letters before it and there's so many thousand letters behind it. So that's how they checked it. They went and found that letter and they counted every letter, both sides. If those two numbers came out different, there's a flaw in that document, it was burned or buried. You don't go through and try to find the, the error and fix it at that point. It's done. They didn't allow mistakes. They knew the center word in the document. Just like the letter. So they would do that test if it passed that one. Then just as a backup, as a precaution, they would go find the center word and then count all the words after it and all the words before it. If those numbers were different, it's a bad document. It's got it's to be gone. So there's, there's something for you to come back at people with. When they say, well, men copied that down. Who knows what they wrote down? They had their own ideas. No, it wasn't allowed. 4,000 rules just in the copying of, of the Torah. And this is, this is thousands of years ago. Okay? Okay. Uh, I got off on a tangent there. I got excited about that scroll this week, man. And, and like I said on Facebook, man, there was, there was some news I learned out there, and I cannot wait for it to go public because I want to share it with you. There's some cool stuff going on regarding the uh, regarding some manuscripts that have been found that it can't go public yet because there's a lot of money at stake if the word gets out. Uh, I cannot wait to share that with you. I, it blew my mind. I don't know if you're excited about it like I am, but it blew my mind. <laughs> so Jesus says, because this church had done these things, he says he opened a door for him to walk through. What door was it? Verse 12. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. There's your door. There's your door. Jesus says, here's what discipleship really is. You follow this. You persevere. I'm going to open a door to the kingdom of heaven, and, and you're, I'm going to bring you in there, and I'm going to establish you there, and you won't have to go out in amongst the junk anymore. And what, what he has the authority to open, nobody has the authority to close. So if you're, if you're saved, if you're a follower today, man, rest in that. There is a guarantee from the word that you know exactly where you're going. Don't let anybody discourage you. Don't let the enemy convince you. 
that you've wandered away and you can't come back. Don't let anybody convince you that, well, you failed yesterday, so that deal's off. That deal is not off. Not off. Just to sweeten the pot a little bit, also he says, you know what, I'm going to open that door. I'm going to establish you in the kingdom of God in heaven. But you know what? There's something else. Verse 9, Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan, all those people that are against you now, the ones that make fun of you and mistreat you and, and poke fun at you and don't believe you and they mock God to your face, all of those people, the synagogue of Satan, who say they're Jews and are not but lie, indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. Now, I don't wish that on anybody, but if they don't turn before that time, they got what's coming to them. At some point, all those people that have been making fun of you and poking you and laughing at you and talking about you behind your back, if they don't turn to Christ before they die, one day they're going to stand there and they're going to know that He loves you. They're going to know that He is real, that He is all-powerful, that their fate is sealed, and they're going to realize that they've been punching and poking and prodding somebody He loves. Can you imagine that moment of sheer terror? when they come to that realization? Will every knee bow and every tongue confess? Absolutely. Will all those people be saved? No. Some of them will show up there never having done that when they had the chance here. And when they finally figure it out, there, it's going to be too late. Take a stand. Be different than the culture. Draw lines in the sand you're not willing to cross. Share the gospel. Love God and love everybody else no matter what. And the only one with authority to open and close doors will open doors of blessings in front of you that you could never imagine. Don't let this church be a social club, a place where like-minded people that enjoy each other's company get together, sing some songs and hang out and have a good, safe place where we can gather. Don't let it be that. Get involved in the battle. It's going around us all the time. Support the teaching that's going on here. If you disagree with something I say, you come talk to me about that. Let's hash it out. Okay, I might be wrong. I know you're shocked. But eventually, I will probably be wrong about something. Support the teaching. Share it with other people. Try to apply it to your life. For heaven's sake, get on the Internet. At least go to the website and click share and send it to Facebook. You never know who might see it doesn't cost you a thing. You don't even have to write. You don't even have to say that you approve it, okay? Just share it. And if somebody clicks on it and hears it and God speaks to them through it, man, how cool would that be? Support that. Support the other ministries. Pray for this new youth group that's up, that God will fill this place with teenagers. Pray for kid church, that all those teachers that give of their time back there would be blessed and they would be planting seed and we'd be able to see the harvest of that. Pray and get get be a part of these wall builders groups where people are 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 getting involved with one another on a smaller scale than this. And they're learning about each other's lives. They're becoming friends. People that they can rely on and trust. Somebody you can call when you're in trouble. Take part in that. These are open doors. These are opportunities. God is blessing all of these things. Get on board. These are open doors. These things aren't going to stop. Get on board. Support those things. And I don't have time to do all the rest of this. Mm. It's not going to happen because I want to show you this video. So, so over the next few weeks, I may bring up some of these other things. The, the real gist of this teaching that I got this week was, if I had to highlight it, it would be praise Jesus for who he is, what his attributes are. Being the one who is honest and true, the one that you can count on. Apply that to your life and, and live the rest of your life according to that truth. Let's be the church that when he writes us a letter at some point, he'll say, you have a little strength down there. You guys are a little feisty. You guys are doing stuff. That's cool. But let's be the church that he says that about. Let's be the church that he says, you kept my word. You kept my word. You didn't forsake my name. You stood with me, not against me. You weren't on the sidelines. You were were there supporting me. Let's be that church.